Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Shouting from the Sidelines. It's uh, it's me, Luke, and, uh, and Nick today again, and we're going to talk today about uh, mindset, about children's mindset. We did a podcast a couple of months back with uh, Ricky Lamb, a uh, black belt martial arts expert who was talking about a, a black belt mindset, um, and we just thought it'd be good to do another one today on similar themes and talking about that in a bit more detail uh, some of the stuff that we've been looking at recently and, and obviously kids going back to school, lockdowns again and everything else. Um, Nick, loving your hair at the moment. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not quite reached record levels, Luke, as you will remember from our college days. Um, I've got a lot to work with if I do decide to push it up at yeah. the moment. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's getting there, but... Um, as you well know, we had a good reason to grow it in college, didn't we, Luke? Yeah, we said in college we said um, we weren't we weren't gonna Nick wasn't gonna shit Nick wasn't gonna cut his hair until we'd lost a college football match and we went unbeaten for uh, <laughs> pretty much a season, um, which was good. And uh, what did you do to your hair, Luke? I, <laughs> <laughs> I I had to get blonde highlights. Uh, had to. Had to. Which was devastating, obviously. Um, I'd know, you know, didn't want to look like David Beckham or anything like that, but I, you know, I got to take one for the team. Um, if a few people haven't read between the lines there, let me just clarify 100% what's gone on here. He wanted highlights in his hair, but he turned it into this thing where he had to have highlights in his hair until we lost, just so he could get it done. He looked well, though, he did suit him. Yeah, yeah. I've had to go for an emergency quiff right yeah, now with mine, but uh, a few weeks and we'll be all right. We'll be looking good again. Um, to all the parents listening, we thought first it might be a good thing just to put your minds at rest a little bit because there's a lot of um, scaremongering at the minute, in, in certainly in, from the media about schools and kids are going to need to catch up and, and all this. And it is pretty scary to read it. You think, is your, you know, is your kid going to have to essentially do a year again? As you know, Nick's a teacher um, part-time around foot tech, so he's in there, he knows what's going on. So Nick wanted to just talk to you a little bit about that first before we get into things, just to maybe put you, again, put your mind at rest. So Nick, over, over to you. What have you been finding since they've come back this first week? Yeah, so clearly this is just my own experiences um, as a teacher, but also as a, as a parent with my children at school uh, and as well as speaking with other you know, the teachers professionally uh, and other parents that I know have got kids of school age. So I can't say it's for everyone, but it's certainly my experience. Um, I remember actually we spoke at the very, very, very start of the first lockdown, trying to, to, to reassure parents and, and making it clear at that point the they weren't going to miss out on a, on a massive amount of learning that the, the activities sent home were just to keep them occupied. That being said, I think at that point, it was probably looking at a month or two in lockdown and getting back, back to it. And so understandably, as that time went on, then there were concerns growing as to what they're missing a lot of school here. You know, it's going to be a serious issue. And then like, like you said, talking about five terms next year and longer school days and shorter summer holidays, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, thankfully, uh, I would say certainly from my experience with my class um, is they are not a, a year behind. They don't need to do an extra term to catch up or longer school days or anything like that. Uh, and that's certainly been the same for, for, for my daughters with their schooling as well. And as I say, teachers, uh, other schools that, I, that, that, I'm not, that I'm not in are saying the same thing as well. Uh, it might be different with, with secondary age children who are doing exams and stuff. Uh, I can see how they've maybe not been uh, or maybe missed out on some things this year but I don't know but for me um certainly reassuring they've they've come back they've got on with it the the best thing to see this week is just the fact that they've been able to be with each other so play times just what, what the, the chance they get to talk to each other and socialize that's been huge this week huge but that being said by like day two it was like they hadn't had any time off it was just they, you know they were fully back to it loving it and they've been great in the lessons as well. Um, yeah. Part of that might be that they haven't been there for so long, so maybe it'll all go downhill pretty quickly soon. But no, it's been really, really positive. So my, my, uh, what would I, I, what I would say is, yeah, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. Um, they are very, very resilient children, and they adapt to things really, really well, as we've seen through this lockdown and this home learning generally. Um, and as I say, my experience is only, but it's all, we're all good. Nothing to panic about. Good. Oh, that puts people's minds at rest because every time you open, um, you know, a news channel or whatever, it's just a little bit. It's a little bit scary. because it makes sense because it, we, we've missed this much school, so it, it completely logically to think, oh well, they need that much school to to, to, to recover that time. Um, but I think it just shows 
just the way that learning occurs and takes place it's a gradual thing you can't really rush it uh, or anything like that and kids are what they are and they will be where they will be yeah cool um and that leads us on nicely so we we we've been thinking a lot about mental health children's resilience mindset and so on um children are more resilient than we like to think they are and however there's always things that we can do as parents to help facilitate a, a stronger mindset and, and help them through some challenges and stuff like that and learn, learn to deal with those challenges. We put together a, a mindset course for, for March. Uh, it's this last, the last month, fingers crossed, that we, we had, we're not going to be doing any sessions. So we gave them an activity to do at home, which will get them right and get them ready for the, for the return of football. And it was a mindset course, loads of little challenges and linking it all back to footballers. So we tried to make it fun for them where they'll learn what separates a footballer with a really good mindset, a really strong mindset to one that, that doesn't have that and, and how they can apply it to their own lives. So we thought we'd do this podcast today to go over some of that detail and just give you some examples of, um, you know, of, of the things that we can do as parents to help our children in these situations and what not to do and, and so on. Um, and I think the first thing certainly I wanted to talk about, Nick, was comfort zones Um the di- dangerous me, places exactly for anybody not just a kid for anybody and mm-hmm. um yeah there, there is no sort of there, there's no growth no success occurs in comfort zones once you reach a comfort zone you need to look at the next the next step and i think certainly for children this applies if you want if you want to look at them learning something new getting better at a sport or whatever it might be you, you need to start thinking right are they, are they too much of a comfort zone so yeah we we want to talk a little bit about about that and about the the benefit of being of getting comfortable being uncomfortable if that makes sense if if and some prime examples of this would be things like in a football context if if your child is head and shoulders better than the, a team that they're training with and I'm talking you know ridiculously you know out of the question sort of better then is it is it a ben, is it beneficial to him or her being there? Are they too comfortable? Do they need to be tested? Do they need to be put into an older age group or a better team or whatever? That is a prime example of a comfort zone. Uh, something that we look at, don't we, at the sessions is uh, the kids that are at the groups. Do we do we need to push him or her up to the next level because they're just far and away better than than the than the groups there? So. This is a this is a big thing, and it's great when when you when your child is doing well, when you're doing well, and you know smashing all records and winning football matches, coming home with the ten out of ten on the spellings and all that good stuff. But you've got to start asking yourself: at what point are they just too much in a comfort zone? Um, does that make sense, Nick? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's like it's that place where you're not necessarily progressing anymore. Right, you've got to a level where you can do what you're doing and then that's it. You're going to keep doing those same things, but you're not going to progress and and, and move on to the next level. And like you say, that can be for a a number of problems, avoiding challenge or or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, We spoke, we spoke a few, I think it was like maybe the second or third episode of the podcast with a a guy called Aaron that had been with Leeds United for a number of years in their academy. And he was talking about the comfort zones there and how that everything's just laid on for the players it's all, it's a nice inside training environment. It's, you know, it's a really nice, just a nice place to be. But he felt that they were maybe missing out on a little bit of grittiness, um, a little bit of bite from being in that comfort zone too much where he was sort of saying, you know, maybe maybe training outdoors a few times a week in winter would do them some good and uh, and that sort of stuff. And it, is, it, is, it was really interesting talking to him about it and, um we were thinking weren't we about about some of the best players in the world and their them their approach to this comfort zone mentality and and a big one a big one is ronaldo um as in as in portuguese ronaldo and he he's renowned for his recovery and how much he looks after himself and you're thinking he's what he's what 34 35 now he's still firmly at the top of his game uh, I think he's just surpassed 20 goals this season at the time of, uh, of speaking. Again, I think he's done a record 14 in a row or some 20, 20 plus goals a season. And 
his powers are maybe waning in some areas, but he's been able to stay at the top of that game simply because of how well he looks after himself. His comfort zone now is, or would have been years ago, he's a multimillionaire. He's won everything there is to win, certainly at a club level. He's regarded as one of the best ever. So he could almost go into a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a winding down period, couldn't he? But he takes himself out of his comfort zone every single day by training those extra hours. His recovery, I believe, involves things like ice baths, um, cryotherapy and, and long periods of stretching and things like that. Stuff that takes time, time away from his family, time away from probably just chilling out and doing stuff that he maybe wants to do. But this is all taking himself out of his comfort zone every single day has led to him being the best consistently, one of the best in the world for what, a decade now, maybe more. Um, but then we, you were saying before, weren't you? You were contrasting that with Wesley Snyder as a, as a good example. So yeah, if you, you obviously t- tell us a bit about what happened with him from a contrast point of view. Yeah, so he, he was just asked the question about Ronaldo and, and Messi, I think it was, who, who he thought was the better player and, and how he compared to them. And he, he as much said, basically, I talent-wise, I think I could have been a Messi or Ronaldo. I, I, I don't think they were, they were that far ahead of me. It came down to attitude and mentality. They, they wanted it more, they trained harder, they did more, and it was simple as that. Now, what's really important to, to acknowledge here is Wesley Snyder, Snyder played at the very, very top level. He won a Champions League, he played in a World Cup final. He is not a bad player. He certainly couldn't be described as having a poor mindset, but it shows how amazing Ronaldo's mindset is. It's levels and levels above, even from other elite world-class performers. So there's always, always more room to grow. The one about Ronaldo, the thing about Ronaldo that gets me, I don't, I don't know how true the quote actually is because it comes out every time he joins a new club where one of the other players at the club, so I think Madrid was the first time I heard it, one of the Madrid players um, wanted, oh no, they just signed for Madrid and they wanted to get in the next day early for training to, you know, to show off to all their uh, teammates. So they rocked in. And uh, sure enough, Cristiano Ronaldo was already in there and he'd already been training an hour. And this, this quote comes out every time he moves to a new club. So I, I don't know how much truth is in it, but there's certainly truth in his attitude. He And, and another quote from Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, I remember hearing was, I'm the best because I train the best. Mm-hmm. And that, that's his mentality. He knows he's going to do more training than anyone else. He's going to do the most. He's going to do the best training. So that's going to equal him being the best player. It's not, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is, Training, we're talking with kids here. It's a it's a different sort of thing. He's he's got to the point where he's he's so good, but that 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 has almost that that's almost become a comfort zone for him. So he's asking himself, what can I do to get better and take myself out of that comfort zone? So it is things like train before everybody else, train after everybody else, sacrifice that time that that maybe I could be doing other things. Cold therapy, these things that other players might not be prepared to put them so I, I believe he does um his sleep schedule as well I think he, he he's he's really keen on sleep yeah, he had a sleep specialist at Man United he's had that for years hasn't he yeah. um I think it was I think it was Phil Neville as well recently speaking to the uh women in the English player yeah um and talking about his uh his attitude to training and it was and he went through his schedule he says he does this then he does this then he does this then he does this every day hours and hours and hours of training but only one of those hours was his team training, like his, his Juventus training, or whoever he was at, at that time. Mm. So he's training for six, seven, eight hours a day. But in his in his job role as a player for Juventus, he only had to do an hour. But all of the extra stuff is what you're saying. He said, no, I'm, I'm not doing an hour. I'm doing the most, the best training every day because I want to be that player. I don't just want to be a professional player for Juventus. I want to be the player in the world. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And, and this is, and we used him as an example on our course for, for our members and, one of the challenges that we set was write down all your tasks for a week. So write down a timetable, school, sleep, eating, family time. Then look at how many hours you've got left. If you want to get better at football or get better at maths or improve your spellings, whatever it might be, there, those blocks of time there are yours. So what are you going to do with them? Are you going to play PS4? Is it PS4, PS5 now? It tells you my age, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> are we still playing Tetris? Um, so are they gonna are they gonna do that or are they gonna use that time to take themselves out of the comfort zone, get off that Xbox or what have you, and get out and do some some practice? And that was one of the challenges we set. And we 
we uh, I think I think I've told you this before, but I, I, this whole thing about comfort zones it, it is fascinating. It is fascinating what you can do as a person, not just kids, but us as adults, when you do take yourself out of that comfort zone. And as you know from from many years of knowing me, two things that I love more than anything else, or, or hate more than anything else, I hate being cold, and I hate. I hate being woken up and not being able to sleep in. So obviously we've setting up a football coaching business with yourself outside. It's like I had to learn to deal with that. And if I was playing football, never a problem. Sleeves rolled up and whatever else, warm all the time because you're running about. Coaching is very different. Um, so it was like, right, you're going to have to learn to deal with that. So how are you going to learn to deal with it? So I, at the time I was reading a lot about um, cold therapy, Mm -hmm. I think Ronaldo obviously is a big point and a lot of clubs do it now, the cold ice baths and things like that. Uh, and it wasn't just about the health benefits of it. I just thought, well, actually that might, that might make my tolerance to cold a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more. So a few, a few, well, I mean, a few years ago now, I just started dabbling with cold showers. So I'd have a hot shower and then towards the end, I'd just have 30 seconds of it cold. Then I did a minute and then I did, and I'm on to, I do two and a half minutes now. Um, at the end, and I have to say, like it's it it's 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 amazing. I do, I feel brilliant now for doing it as as a, as a byproduct. But the other by the other byproduct is that when I'm out there, when we're out there in the middle of January, uh, wet wind, whatever coming at us, it's like you can deal with it a little bit more just from coming out of that comfort zone a little bit. Um, and it goes back to a book that I read, which. Um, which is well worth a read. It's a guy called Ross Edgley. And this maniac swam around Great Britain. Uh, he stayed on sea. He, so he stayed on a boat and, and he, he did it. I think it took him three months. And there's all sorts of stories in there that he was swimming for miles of a jellyfish attached to his face without realizing and all sorts of stuff. Um, but he, he, he quoted a couple of things that really stood out, which I'll mention. And one of them was, was, was called Getting Wintered. So he said that, I don't know how true this is, but he said that in, in Roman times, the, they used to train. The wars were generally thought through the summer. And again, I don't know how true this is. <laughs> wars were generally thought fought through the summer. So they would train, the, 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 the Roman armies would train through the winter and they called it getting wintered because if they could train through that in the freezing cold um, and get to the levels they to get to, then come the summer when it's, it's a little bit nicer, it's a little bit easier and it sort of made sense. And he used yeah. a lot of these principles to, um, to get, his, get his mind right for swimming around there in freezing cold water and one thing or another. And then another one that he said, I have to read this out. He, this is called the general theory of self-discipline. And this apparently comes from the Spartans, which are, are my ancestors, Nick. <laughs> 300. <laughs> um, to regularly do that which is hard but important when it feels most uncomfortable is how warriors are born. And Love I thought it. that, yeah, that nails it, doesn't it? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And a warrior in this, in our context is, is success. It's nailing that spelling test because you worked a couple of extra hours on it. Um, improving your football because you worked an extra few hours and took out, took yourself out of your comfort zone when you didn't want to. Um, yeah. I mean, those kids. Oh, yeah, when you didn't want to, you you mentioned the the weather and stuff. There, I think that's I think that's key. Um, obviously, we we're, we're out year round and we're pretty well known for it. Um, and we're we're happy to do that. But in, in, we we make sure, for example, coaches. Not you're not allowed your hands in your pockets while you're coaching and things like that. However, called it, you can wear gloves. You know, <laughs> we're, not, we're not awful people. You can you keep your hands warm. But it's just about standards and attitude and. And I think modeling that to children, showing them that you're happy to be there in the cold, you're happy to get wet today and still carry on what you're doing, and that passes on to them rather than, oh, it's a bit cold today. I don't really, yeah, it. yeah. Oh, it's a bit wet yeah. today. It, it, you, you've got to model what you want. And I can't remember the name of the guy, but I remember speaking to you about a guy before who he had a, uh, he had his first kid and he, he wanted to really flip it on its head. So his mentality bringing up his child was whenever it rained, he'd go to, oh, yes, it's raining, it's raining, come on, let's get outside. Yeah. And he just completely switched it on its head and that's uh, that'll get that child used to being out in the rain and not thinking it, it's bad. It's, you know, weather is weather. It's, it's You shouldn't really call it good or bad weather. It's weather is weather, isn't it? You can, it was that guy, I tell you, it was that chess prodigy. The guy, yes. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Finding Bobby Fisher's about him. I forget his that's name. It. He said that's how he is with his son. But yeah, yeah, it ma- it makes sense. Um, the the other one that I mentioned was sleep, and like when I when I was up until up until maybe mid twenties, um, I would sleep until the final minute that I knew. You used to have naps, you. That's why I remember on, on Saturdays, you'd go play football, wouldn't you? Come home, have your nap, and then come out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. I just love I, lo- I still love sleep. It's just obviously a lot harder to get now. But I thought when when we, when my wife fell pregnant, when Claire fell pregnant with our first child, Edie, I thought this is going to turn my world upside down. Not, obviously, it was going to turn your world upside down anyway, but from a sleep perspective. And so I thought, right, I can, I can moan about it or I can start dealing with it now in anticipation of that. So going back to this thing about getting wintered and stuff, I read the book, which I lent to you, The 5am Club. So I just went from, (laughs) I just went from zero to 100, basically. (laughs) Instead of getting up at like 7.30, uh, 8 o'clock, it was just going to get up at 5am. And and it was awful. It still is. it's, It's hell on earth for about... 20 minutes until you come round and then it's it's brilliant now you you know the fact that you get that peace and quiet before anyone wakes up I've got two kids now obviously so before before they wake up I can have this sort of hour hour and a half um I don't not every night obviously sometimes they wake up whatever, but more time not you know nine times out of ten and and it's true just taking myself out of that comfort zone and doing this and just just thinking, no, I'm just got to do it. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. it. It's brilliant. I can get more work done in the morning now because it's a bit more quiet. And it certainly helped through lockdown in that, in that way with, with the, uh, having everybody at home. So yeah, it's just, it is, it works for adults as well. So mm. if, uh, if you ever feel anyone listening, if there's ever anything that you don't like doing, just do it and just keep <laughs> doing it until you really like it. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. Um, we were going to talk as well about some of the stuff that parents, maybe we as parents do, that sometimes you just really need to take a breath and think, is that is that best for our kids? Because um, I'm saying all this now, and I'll, I've got no no um, you know no worries in telling you that certainly Edie has me wrapped around her little finger, and there's sometimes when I'm pandering to her and I just have to stop myself and think no 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 no. remember what you preach <laughs> remember what you preach and do it um so I, I'm as bad as anybody in, in that regard and we all are we want our kids to be happy don't we? we want them to we don't want them to be upset about things but sometimes there are examples of things when you just maybe think about and one of them what we've, we've spoke about before is when we sometimes get emails saying can um or can so-and-so be on the same team as so-and-so can they be in the same group as so-and-so at a camp for example or something like that and it's fine you know we get it but is is it is that is it massively beneficial for them that they're always going to be in that group with their very best friends great that they get to have some time with their friends but think about the comfort zone thing and think well is there a bet is there a bigger benefit to them being to not to that not happening if they end up with each other great but if not then maybe they've had to increase their social skills by talking to somebody that they've not spoken to before again does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think coming back to what we've just said about the weather and like, like modeling behavior if you're if your child's coming home and saying oh i was with i don't know i want to be in another group or another team or something like that and then you go and contact us and that that moves happen what what is it you've taught your child there that when things are going against them, when things are not enjoyable, then just get out of it. We're really, because if, if, if you speak to us, something we do get, it, we always come back to the reason where they are and who they're playing with is purely for development purposes. They are in our view, the best place for them to improve the most at football. So like, like you said, you asking them to move, you might be thinking you're looking out for your, your own child, uh, which is a very noble thing to do. But like Luke says, you have to step back and look at the bigger picture. Is that action there? Although it might have some short-term gain, what are you actually teaching them how to deal with those kind of situations in future? It is, we're dealing with the most precious thing in our lives. And if something triggers, triggers us on a negative basis, maybe they've come home upset about something, but equally, if, it, if it's something that they really want to happen like that, I want to be my friends, I want to be my friends then yeah, we sometimes just need to take a breath and think, is it, 
like you say, bigger picture stuff. Is it is yeah. it is, is yeah. it better for them that they're not? Uh, not like I say, it's not like we're going to deliberately keep people apart. No, but... no, 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 no. That's it. And we have more than more often that we have put people together when, when that question has been asked. It's not something we're against as long as it still fits in with our views on development. As long as it, 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 that isn't compromised, then yeah, we're more than happy to make people uh, happy and play with their friends. That's a big thing of what we're into. Hundred um, percent. And the other the other thing from a from a parental point of view, and you as a teacher. You've said you've clearly seen I mean, about when we talk about resilient kids, um, it's easy to sometimes fall into the trap of thinking these kids that have come from nothing, that have worked their way up and uh, have had to be, you know, had to fight throughout their lives and then go on to be a big success in the future in sport or business or whatever. It's not always the case, is it? And you, you know, you you tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Just when we were talking about this and, and planning for it, and um, we came up with loads of examples of of people who've overcome real challenge and real difficulty to achieve success, almost to the fact where the narrative is now is you have to have some kind of real obstacle in your way to have any kind of success. And I think looking at it, there's plenty of examples out there where it might be people who've had challenge as well. But I think a lot of these people who go on to achieve real success, uh, again, in sport business, have come from a, a background of a lot of security and stability um, in terms of their parents. They feel very loved and cared for and nurtured. And that gives them a, a confidence in the world to go out and try things and, and make mistakes uh, and learn from those because they've got that just that loving background behind them I, th I think if you don't have that and then you, all of a sudden you start making mistakes you've got nothing to fall back on um certainly if, from from a teaching perspective the, the biggest challenge with with children I think is them understanding the importance of mistakes and the value of mistakes and how that is where learning occurs and that needs to happen for them to progress um I had the conversation with my class today actually completely coincidentally but so we use different colour pens at school whether, when I'm marking whether they've got something right or they've got something wrong. And then they, they need to use a purple pen to respond to that. And I was trying to explain to them today where, so I use yellow when it's right and green when it's when it's wrong or it needs, needs changing. I spend less, a lot less time looking at the things that are yellow than I do when they're green because what the, their mistake tells me what they need to be taught next. Mm. And I, But children... They, they struggle to see that. And it's like, no, a mistake is wrong. A mistake is bad. And I have to say to them every day, because it'll get to the point where they would, they'd be really reluctant to use the purple pen because if they have to write a, a whole new sentence out again at the bottom of their paper, it's a big purple sentence. And they think that's a big, it's a big mistake right there. And I, I train students, no, it's not. This is where you're learning and you're correcting your mistake and you're progressing. If you gave me a piece of work every day and it was just yellow, 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 well, you're in your comfort zone. You're not going anywhere. And I don't know where you need to go next. So those mistakes are the only way we can drive it forward. So it's so important. It's a real, but I, I find that as a challenge every year with every class I have for them feeling comfortable enough to show me their mistakes and admit their mistakes, understanding that, that I can carry them forward that way. There's definitely a mental block there around the idea of it being wrong. Yeah, that comes back to what you just said there about about resilient kids. That nine times out of ten, they've got that support network and and they've been cared for at home. That that they feel maybe more confident coming forward with a mistake yeah. or trying yeah. something because they know that if they fail, they're not going to be told off. They're going to be yeah. they've got that support and it doesn't come down to the environment. And we we've been big 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 on that from day one we are one of our founding mantras was you don't stop you don't correct you don't tell them what they've done wrong that's that's getting nobody nowhere anytime it's a positive environment it's encouragement it's what did they do right even if they do something wrong did they try to do the right thing that's much more important than than the end goal um again as i've gone on as a teacher when it comes to marking as i, as I just said that it's not I'm not looking for what's good anymore. Not, I shouldn't say anymore. That's a bit too definitive. But yeah, it's much, much, much more about what's the mistakes. Why mm. couldn't they do what I needed them to do? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And it's it'll matter when they're playing for England in a World Cup final when a certain mistake is is a huge is a huge thing potentially a difference between winning and losing. But in a classroom environment, in a grassroots football training session or football match a mistake we should go after mistakes and understand because we want to know where where they need help where they yes. can improve and 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 this is one of the subjects in the in the course that we sent out to our members is is 
learning learning from failure um we don't lose we learn and that's the idea it's it's not so much celebrating losing or, or no. celebrating failure it's just it's taking the positives from it and and moving on more success you, you you look at failure to get more success yeah you're absolutely we're not celebrating failure it's not a good thing but you but you, you, you take it to have more success down the road yeah 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 100% and you can these questions from a from a parent point of view what this sort of practical things you can do in that regard is is question is question your child if they've you know if they, if you've watched them play football and they maybe had a bad game um or, may, or you know maybe they did a free kick that went wrong i don't know you just ask them ask them questions what do you think you could have done better um these sorts of things that gets them thinking and they can then start thinking about it themselves and then maybe giving you the correct answers and it, it can be applied across the board but if, if you just involve them and let them understand that it's not a bad thing that they've that, that mistakes happened it's just a chance for us to get better it's a yeah. it's a big thing and i think um the more that we're reading up on um you know coaching techniques teaching techniques and i think think football coaching is changing slowly but surely that i, I think it's going to get to the point where it almost goes back to pure street football in, in many regards where you've got a group of kids and the coaches are there just to facilitate the session, be timekeepers, make sure health and safety and rules are followed and everything else. But essentially you're letting them play because you want them to learn from what they're doing and, and making mistakes too. There's still too much stop start stuff from, from sessions that we see. There's not enough ro ball rolling time, um, too much, coaches jumping in just to show that they know some stuff yeah. the kids the kids don't learn from that really we used to think they do but they don't i don't think adults do to be perfectly honest if you were just in the middle of doing summer and getting told to stop and then lecture to for an hour about what you've done wrong i don't really think that works with us so it won't work with kids um and i, I do see that I do see that going the way it's going, really. Um, and I think some, like ourselves, will embrace it faster than others. Um, yeah, no, that's good. I look, I look I, before, like I say, while we're planning for this, I was thinking about my, our, you know, our childhoods and, and times that this happens. Because when we were kids, you never really spoke about a child's mindset. You never really spoke about mental health generally, let alone for children. And so it is difficult. But there are examples when I look back and I think, yeah, that that maybe helped me improve in this area or get better in that area. And I look back to, uh, to when I first started playing football, I hated tackling, hated it. Um, I mean, I couldn't do much else to be perfectly honest. I don't know why I hated it, but, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> um, but well, my granddad being, um, you know, being my granddad, he was a typical sort of get stuck in, get stuck in. But the more he, going back to this support thing, he just used to repeat, 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 get stuck in, get stuck in. If you don't tackle properly, you're going to hurt yourself and so on and so on. And, so on. and it just went and went and went and went and went. He was there every week though, wasn't he? He was there every week on the side. You know, it, it, it was supportive. Oh, you know? yeah, he didn't miss a game. Didn't miss a game and uh, rain or shine. And, um, you know, it's not like you were a, a young guy. He's just a young guy, obviously. But he, um, he just kept going. And it got to the point where I learned to love it because he was... He praised me so much for for a tackle more than a goal in the car on the way home that I thought, oh, actually, yeah, that's uh, I, I, this, I feel good from that. So I started doing it again and again, and managed to play for a few more years after that. And one of the biggest things I used to do was <laughs> was tackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was because of I, him. I, I think that's massive. I, th I think with, with young children in particular, I think that's an area you you can really really help them because what you see with a lot of children is. They're, they're active in the game when they've got the ball. And then when they don't have the ball, the game's kind of stopped for them until they get the ball back. There's a lot of younger children who are only really are playing once the ball's at their feet. But if you can encourage that side of things, that tackling's really important, that running's really important, then that means they've always got that. So even if they have a bad game, they've at least done all the stuff they can do every week, which is effort and attitude and running around and trying to make tackles. You won't always have a great game, but you can always, always give 100% effort and have the right attitude. Yeah, that's it. It's, we've talked, spoke about this about like praising effort over over results and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And this is all you will have a bad game with the best of intentions. It happens. You, you yeah. touch can bounce off you, but you you can do the the minimum. You can do the basics that you need to. Definitely, and and it's another again another practical tip for parents is exactly what Nick's just said. Is it's just to overemphasize the positives. Um, if you know they're struggling with something, 
uh, or you or you want them to get better at something you know that's going to help them is just praise that element and we, we can give football examples all day because it's what we do but it again applies to a lot of different things um, just praising their, their their effort praise praise the fact that if you want to get your kid to do more more time on on a on a uh, you know, on, on a maths homework or things like that praise the fact that they've spent 10 extra minutes on that math homework to get better at their times tables um they'll they'll just start to get an intrinsic reward by virtue of doing an extra 10 minutes so they think oh well next time if I do an extra 10 minutes I'm gonna you know mum's gonna be really happy with me again and you can do do the old school bribing stuff where if they do 10 minutes extra they get um we're doing star charts at the minute with with Edie because we wanted to sleep in her own bed and potty train and all that sort of stuff but for the older kids it might be it might be a treat a weekend treat or something and they've got to get so many ticks in a box and then they get a treat whatever you know all these old school things that actually do work when you apply them in the right way but it, it, apply it to things like effort behavior uh, attitude, time spent on something, apply it to those things as opposed to the pure result. And you'll soon see that the results will take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, and back to the comfort zone thing, it's, it's to it's to move on from that and always keep going up. Cause you've talked about how the academy environment can be quite comfortable. And I think that certainly is the case for, for a lot of people. And I think part of that it comes down to the fact that they've made it as far as an academy and they think, well, yeah, I've got here. I'm in the academy. That's it. Now I'm going to move from this age group to the next age group to the next group. And then when I'm old enough, I'll be in the first team. Uh, unfortunately, 0.01% or something is the is the statistic there. But we've got kids that come down to us for one-to-ones who are, are in academies at that level. And they're not just sticking with their academy training. They're saying, right, well, I've got this brilliant opportunity where I've got my foot in the door here, but I know I'm in the most intense competition of my life if I actually want to go and get through to that first team so what can I what can I do more all right I'm going to go to foot tech and do some one-to-ones or whatever and that's just one part these people who are doing things like that will be doing so much more extra training next development and really taking it on board and, and, it, and it is the difference it's as simple yeah. as that that is the difference I know exactly who you're talking about there mm. we won't name him but his attitude is is beyond belief um and, and it, when, you, when you think back to everything that we've just been talking about, comfort zone, supportive parents, learning from failure, he, he, his support network around yeah, him massive. is brilliant. Um, yeah. His mum and dad, you know, they're, they're there to facilitate. They're not pushing. In fact, there's probably two of the, in terms of academy parents that we've met, they are, they are brilliant in that mm. regard. They don't get too ahead of themselves right. and they're very humble with it. Uh, but and he's flying and I don't think there's a, you know, I don't think it's coincidence. I really no. don't. 100%. Is that picture of um, remember that picture of Messi and Suarez on deck chairs watching their kids play footy? Yeah, it's the, the, the people who know, no, don't <laughs> just exactly, sit back yeah, and exactly. relax. Exactly, but he, he takes himself out of his, out of his comfort zone by coming to extra training when a lot of his teammates won't do that. Um, he learns from failure. We I remember we did some recording with him and sent him. I mean, he was he was asking his mum to, to text us to say, can we get those videos to him sooner? Because yeah. <laughs> he wanted to learn from what he'd done and, uh, and the mistakes he'd made at that session. So yeah, it is, what we say isn't, it isn't just picked from the sky, it's, it's proven and not just from us, but from a lot of other people that are, uh, you know, uh, researchers and so on that have, that have looked into this. I think um, what is important here, is certainly with that example there, is it, it, it is driven from the individual. You could talk all day as much as you want to your kid about having a better mindset. But it has to come from them. They have to make the change. They have to take it on board, and then they have to they drive it forward. Yeah, and and there is, but I think I think when a parent listens to that, sometimes they'll feel like their kid might be a lost cause. No, because it's growth. We've got the idea of growth mindset and fixed mindset, isn't it? Everyone, everyone is capable. Everyone can change. Everyone can do better. You just got to believe that and and take the steps. And it's and it's a process. It's a long process. You you've got to keep working at things if you really want to succeed. But that goes back to what we've said, though, is that if you have if you have a child like that, um, it just go back to the basics and, and be praising those little bits of extra effort that they do, and. It'll be a slower process, but lo and behold, you will get them to that point where they do have that fire in their belly. Um, it's easy to think people are born like that, but a lot of the a lot of the time, it can be instilled. It's just mm-hmm. using some of these techniques. Um, Nick, that's been good, and I hope everybody's taken some some uh, some positives from that and some tips. Um, just before we go, Nick, I wanted to say a big happy birthday. Thank you very much, sir. Thirty-five years young today. Did my present come? Uh, not yet, mate. No, is it a good one? 
uh, it'll, be, it'll be coming on an 18 wheel. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Your street's pretty tight, and it? it'll, it'll be, be there soon. Don't worry. Big... <laughs> Some boy. <laughs> no, I've got myself a new uh, a new Rondo book for my birthday, so I'll spend the afternoon with that. I do believe that's a little ready insight into the training. A little ready ins- for the return of foot tech. That's what yeah. I'm ready for. That's a little insight into Nicholas Bishop there for you, rock and roll. <laughs> um, no, yeah, it's looking forward to getting going again. So. As always, guys, if you could um, if you could leave us a review, that would be brilliant. If you could share any of these podcasts with uh, people that you think would benefit from listening to them, please do. Subscribe and all that good stuff. And um, if you have any ideas, any things that you'd like us to talk about on these, again, just drop us a message. We're always, always um, looking for new ideas. So, um, yeah, that's it. Have, uh, have a great day, Nick, and we'll see you all soon. Yeah, thank you very much. See you later, guys.